So I uh, welcome you again. I thank you for being here. I'm excited to introduce DJT this morning. And if you would, please, a warm welcome, DJ. You just have to. We were just hooked together by God. And, you know, God has just brought along people to help me on this new journey I'm on. First of all, before we even get started, for you women, these are new big old shoes I have on. <laughs> now, if I have to take them off later, it's because I have blisters I bet. And this is my first time. I hope there will be many more, but this is my first time to speak to a group of women. And when Debbie was dying, she told me, she said, uh, God has shown me in a vision that you're going to be telling our story to thousands of people. That has always stuck with me because as I share some of my life with you, you'll see it is nothing but the hand of God that has brought me to this place today. And that I hope any of you that need to find yourself in my story somewhere can look at me today and say, God forgives, he restores, and he gives second chances. And I am a product of that. You know, the woman that wrote with me, Andrea Taylor, she said, here's what we're going to do. Anytime you're out, Let's just say God is the choreographer, and let's just dance with him. So join me in my dance today as I begin to share my story with you. Now remember, I'm going to be looking a little bit. Don't expect too much from me <laughs> as we go through the book. <laughs> I'm going to put this over here for right now. When same kind of different came, uh, difference uh, came out as me, um, Ron Hall had no idea what was going to happen when he and Denver started writing. It became a New York bestseller. And a lot of people discovered that I was the twin sister of Miss Debbie in the book. And as far as I'm concerned, she was the main character. There wouldn't have been a story without her. She was the leading lady. And these unlikely people, these two men that were brought together by Deborah's dream, about a homeless man, all of a sudden, their hearts totally different. He was homeless. He's an international art dealer. Their hearts were joined together, and they became one. And that's why, you know, I want to make sure that we realize we're all the same. God maybe put different colors on us and different voices and different eyes or whatever, but we're all the same. We never want to forget that. And after the success of Ron and Denver's book, when people began to find out I was Miss Debbie's twin sister, they said, you have a story to tell. Well, the end of uh, December 2011, our Southern Breeze became a reality. And let me say this, I am humbled, absolutely humbled at this opportunity that I have. Oh, I mean, do I look horrible now? <laughs> the thing that's so amazing, and y'all really, I still cry when I read this silly book and it's my story, but it just shows you what God can do to a broken woman who had absolutely no hope for life. The story of mankind is divided into two parts. There's the before, which is B.C., and the after, which is A.D. And the same was true for Deborah and me. Our turning point in our life that changed everything was in Anaheim, California, February, mid-February 
1990. And from that day forward, we always referenced our lives as before Anaheim and after Anaheim. The before part of my story, and even my pastor, when he read it, he said the first half of that book is hard to read. Well, there was a reason that I took my mask off and told the truth about who I was. It wasn't easy at all. I worried about my children, reading some of the stuff that everybody would read. Let me just say this real quick. When you take your mask off and you tell the truth, God's light shines on shame and it'll be gone forever. So what we need to do is begin to start taking our mask off, tell the truth, and let God heal those wounded hearts that we, so many of us carry. The abuse for Deborah and me started early in life. Um, we were probably three or four. And I don't know what went wrong with my daddy, but he physically, sexually, and mentally abused us. I probably got the most of the mental abuse. But one event that happened separated us severely. So these two little girls that shared our mother's womb, we were completely separated from each other. And the picture on the book shows two little girls holding hands and smiling in our little starch strip uh, uh, dresses. But it was that event where we quit holding hands and we were never together again. Deborah closed off her heart and she was no longer willing to be my friend. And I needed her friendship desperately. And to cope with the abuse, what I did was I shed all the healthy boundaries around me and I sold my soul to anybody that promised temporary relief from my pain. The older we got, the more separate we became. And our twin bond was then broken. And we suffered in our own ways. Deborah was cold, withdrawn, and a perfectionist. Now, you know, I know you that read same kind of different as me thought she was born with a crown on her head, but guys, I lived with her. She was <laughs> in The older she got, she began chasing God. I was chasing love in all the wrong places. My low self-esteem caused me to make terrible choices, and I hungered for acceptance. Deborah <coughs> hated my destructive behavior. She became judgmental, and she began to push me totally out of her life. I want to say this really quick. When there is sexual abuse in a family, people will go two ways. One, you're hungry for someone to love you. The other one, you close yourself off from everything. So your heart is totally closed off. That's what happened to us. And our estranged older sister, Gretchen, she didn't uh, suffer from the abuse that we did. But unfortunately, my mother began to give her prescription narcotics when she started her period to alleviate, the cram uh, alleviate her cramps. Well, her drug dependency from that time on carried on until she, well, through adulthood. And what happened, that resulted in the three of us never really ever being able to experience the joy of being sisters. And you know, when I hear people talk about growing up with sisters, Karen Finley, my friend, I mean, she's got two other sisters, and they love each other dearly. And then I began to see what all Gretchen and Deborah and I missed growing up. What happened, we were five people in a family living under the same roof, and we're totally separate. While Deborah was uh, striving to make perfect grades, I was striving to survive. By the time I was in the seventh grade, I started cheating. My mother really encouraged these labels. She would stay up all night researching a paper. She would write it all out for me or type it really, and all I had to do was just sign my name on the paper. And you know, it seemed like a great solution for me. But what happened is that I never learned anything. And 
it was a horrible, horrible thing because cheating my way through school kept me from being punished by my dad. And I couldn't learn. My mind was just so unclear of things that, unfortunately, I began to label myself as dumb and stupid. And, you know, the way that my family treated me, they were confirming that I was dumb and stupid. And I'm just going to say this real quick. Walking into a classroom for me, when there was a test, my hands would start shaking so much I could hardly hold the pen in my hand. Because if I didn't find someone to sit next to to cheat, I wouldn't even be able to pass the test. So if you can just imagine, even to this day, I can still go back and feel that pain and that fear. Well, when it was time to go to college, Deborah, of course, was so thrilled. She joined a sorority and mother bought her a bunch of new clothes and she met her husband-to-be, Ron Hall, and when they graduated, they uh, got married and adopted two beautiful children. Her life was flourishing and mine was deteriorating fast. Now, after cheating my way through school, when it was time for me to go to college, that was the last place I wanted to be, but my mother and dad had a different plan for me. They were going to go, I mean, they were forcing me to college, and I think because they didn't want me to be in the house, but anyway. Now, they dropped me off at my dorm. The first thing I did was run to the store, buy a carton of cigarettes, and a pretty new purse. Well, that pretty new purse began a little bit of a problem for me down the road, but all of a sudden, what happened is I had used all my money for the whole month and I had no money. And well, that's a little hard when you're at school, so I needed some funds. I needed some money that month. So I don't know if anyone else in the room would have done this, but you know, the only thing I could think to get money from were my book and my meal tickets. So <laughs> literally, now you can tell me, was college a real high priority for me? Not really, but here I am. No money, well, a little money that I made off of that, but I had no books, I had no meal ticket. Thank God I got sick. I got sick enough that I got to drop out of college, <laughs> and that was a blessing to me at the time. Well, after I dropped out of college, I became pregnant at 19, and it was my first love, who was 21. To have a baby, I can't look at you. <laughs> Yes, see, I didn't want to do that. But to have a baby and be completely broken, we weren't any more ready to be parents, and we weren't ready to be husband and wife. Our precious children, John, Kevin, and Denise, they suffered. We all suffered. After Denise was born, depression invaded my life. Not knowing what to call them, we were referred to my dark times as spells. I mean, no one was talking about depression back then, so we called them spells. Suicide was on my mind constantly. I would stand in front of a mirror, and I would just start screaming as loud as I could. I was in so much pain that I didn't have enough left for anybody. I can't tell you the number of goodbye letters I wrote, and I would cry the whole time. But then, luckily, by the time I finished writing, I would change my mind. Never did at that point. Now, even though I was very depressed because of our need for money, I had to get a job when Denise was a month old and didn't even get to be with her when she was a tiny baby. My first interview was a disaster. What happened? I went in and I think, cause you know, I mean, I'm pretty friendly and you know, they said, fine, you know, you've got the job. Just go take the aptitude test. The minute they said that, I started crying and I ran out of the room. I'm not sure if they ever did know why I left in, in such a hurry. But see, my life was, see, Deborah used to always say, 
God gives us the ability to make choices. But you know what? We suffer the consequences of choices that we make. So I began a pattern of suffering the consequences of never learning anything, never learning since the seventh grade. The spells still came, but they didn't come as often. Now, after struggling about 18 years, my marriage was finally ending and divorce. My depression increased, and it became unbearable. Without writing any goodbye letters, I left my job. I just told my employees I had somewhere I had to go. I drove home. I put my car in the garage, left it running, and I remembered that I had some sleeping pills, and I didn't know if it hurt to die. And so there I was. The Message Bible translation speaks to the truth of me that day. This is this. I had my fill of trouble. I'm camped on the edge of hell. By the grace of God, I was found breathing and put into a mental hospital, and there I stayed for a while. While I was in the mental hospital, my doctor said, I'd like to put you through some tests to find out why you're not able to learn. Well, you know, that word test, I said, you're not putting me through any test. <laughs> he said, it's not that kind of test. Well, after a few weeks after I got out of the hospital, I went back, and, and I'll never forget, I can remember sitting in his office, and I was waiting to hear some kind of bad report. Lord knows what was wrong with my mind. He said, Daphne, you're a very smart woman. I had to say to myself, how on earth did I build my life on a lie? Well, now I had a decision to make. I could either continue living the life of a stupid person, or I could choose to live the life of the intelligent woman that God had designed me to be. It would be hard to change my thinking, but I didn't want to be labeled, labeled dumb anymore mainly by myself. Again, God says in his word, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Following our divorce of nearly 18 years, I lost custody of my children. I was alone, and I was desperate for affection. Right away, I started dating a man that told me he loved me. Well, that's all I needed. And one day he was gone. Not only was he gone, but he was gone with all my furniture. He was gone with all my treasured family belongings that I had inherited. And one of Deborah's mink jackets, which didn't seem too well with her. <laughs> I was humiliated. I was ashamed. How on earth could I have let this happen? My life is a complete mess. Now, I, I mean, you know, I have to still it up there. <laughs> you know what I want this to do. As I tell this story, I want you to look at me today and say, God is amazing. He is amazing. Well, I met my second husband, and quickly we married. I quit my job of 18 years. And some people here actually were at the wedding. <laughs> and unfortunately, he, his dream was to move to the North Carolina mountains. Well, I tell you what, I was ready to leave. I was going to run away from everything because I had made such an embarrassing fool of myself in Atlanta. It just seemed like good to be in the North Carolina mountains. The only thing about that is that there were a lot of people on that mountain until wintertime came, and then they all left. <laughs> there, there we were, married to a man I hardly even knew, and I divided my days. Now, I had been in the corporate world. I divided my days into making apple jelly, pickles, and watching TV. Now, Gary didn't like any noise, so what I would do is I would plug in to the edge of the bed as far as I could get to the TV. And 
there was a big mountain, so we only got like one channel. So I'd start my day with cartoons. <laughs> then I would go next to soap operas and whatever came in between. And then at the evening, I'd watch the evening news. Well, it didn't take long for me to gain 20 pounds. I just like blossomed out overnight. And at that time, I was being sucked into a deep, dark hole. And I really, at that point, felt like I had no way of escape. You know, when you just keep making the same mistakes over and over, you got to figure out what on earth is wrong with me. When we decided to move back to Atlanta, I had gone through my savings, and he quit his job. So I had to go find another job. I passed the initial interview with Flying Colors, and I think that's my claim to fame. I can be friendly and smile, but then I thought, well, this is a piece of cake. After they hired me, they said everybody that has been hired has to go through a test. And if you don't pass the test, you don't get to keep working here. Boy, did my fears come back with a vengeance. I became paralyzed with fear. I kept trying to remember what the doctor said. Daphne, you're a very smart woman. Reaching out to my distant twin sister, Deborah, I called her and she said, I'll pray for you. And I prayed for myself. And I asked God, please help me learn. I didn't even know how to learn. Probably took me ten times longer than anybody else that was in that group to even try to comprehend. I'd read and I'd forget, I'd read and I'd forget. And it was just like hell for me, it really was. Well, the morning of the test, I kept saying to myself, this time is gonna be different. <laughs> so, all of a sudden, I said, I'm not dumb, I'm not stupid. And that fear that had crippled me all of my life was leaving. When the test results came back, and they were handing out everything, you know, I'm made next to the highest grade. <laughs> it was just amazing. I had to excuse myself because I didn't want anyone to see my tears of joy. And I ran and I called Deborah. I said, Deborah, I made a grade on my own. We were so excited. It was just like my first grade without cheating. I think what happened that day began to break that fear barrier that had crippled me all of my life. Now, I'm not saying it's easy now. Just preparing for this. My poor little husband, I said, you know, I haven't had time to practice. He said, practice? That's all you've been doing. But, you know, it takes me longer I have to fight that fear of insecurity. But you know what? I've got a God that is big enough to hold my hand and help me through the difficult days. My new job is wonderful, but my life at home is getting much worse. We had married for all the wrong reasons. But, you know, I didn't want our marriage to end. I had already failed at being. So I tried to stay upbeat so people wouldn't know how bad it was at home. And one day, I was daydreaming in my darkness when the phone rang. Well, who was it? Deborah. She never calls me. She said, I want you to go with me to Anaheim, California. We're going to a healing conference. And she said, I'm paying for everything. Well, at that time, I didn't have two nipples to rub together. She said, I'm paying for everything. You have to go. Well, let me just tell you something. She was the boss of me. She was five minutes older. And I, I knew that I was going. It didn't matter whether she was paying or not, I was going. Well, I arrived in, in Dallas the day before we were supposed to go. And Deborah said, I'm going to take you shopping and buy you some pretty clothes to wear, you know, to Anaheim. She was being so generous. And I thought, I, I believe that our years of distance are going away. Well, in Anaheim, Deborah and I roomed together. 
Now, it thrilled me because I thought she probably set it up for us. We had so much catching up to do after all those years. And my hopes were shattered when the lights went out. Deborah asked if I was asleep, and I said no. And I thought, it's going to be like being at a sleepover. And I was so excited that we were finally going to get to talk. Instead, she said, I know you want me to tell you I love you, but I don't. You have been a disappointment to me for so long. I'm just tired of trying anymore. Well, I cried myself to sleep that night. I don't know what she was going through, but I was a disappointment to my twin sister. And I was a disappointment to myself. And I couldn't figure out how to change. Deborah and I had gone to Anaheim for very different reasons. I came craving attention from my twin sister. She took me to the conference not to get close to me, but she wanted God to heal me, to make me right, to make me like her, I think. I also came to escape my broken marriage. She came to Anaheim suffering from a broken heart. She had just discovered that her husband of many years had had an affair. The truth had been exposed and her perfect life was crumbling around her. We both were hurting, and we both needed healing. At each meeting we attended, Deborah invited people to sit between us because she never wanted to sit next to me. And during one session, God touched my heart. So amazing that I just had to get up. I excused myself, and I went back to the room. I fell on the floor. And I began to weep for my lost life, for my lost childhood. That everything went wrong to keep me from being able to know how to be a mom. I don't know how long I stayed on that floor. But once I scraped myself off of the floor, God had heard me. He had forgiven me. He had restored my broken heart. My shame and fear evaporated. By the grace of God, all my ugly burdens were lifted. And in those life-changing moments, I had experienced God's promise. As far as the east is from the west, he has separated us from our sins. When I went back to the session, the seating was the same, so I'm just set at the end of the row. We started singing. There is no God like Jehovah. The louder we sang, the bigger it got. All of a sudden, Deborah looked down at me. And in her mouth, I saw her say, I love you. And all of a sudden, we ran together and embraced for the first time in our lives. I mean, I'll never forget how it felt to be in her arms. God had lifted her ugly burdens. He opened her closed-off heart. Jehovah had softened her with his grace. Deborah overflowed with the love of God. We ran to each other. And I tell you, we were just like little girls. We were crying uncontrollably. The difference is there were a lot of people from Fort Worth and Dallas that knew how separate we had become, they will always remember that hug, <laughs> as I will. We walked out of that session hand in hand, just like two little girls, and we were stopped by a man that we didn't even know. The stranger said, God has given me a word for the two of you. Will you receive it? Now, how many in this room would say no to that? <laughs> well, I said yes, that's for sure. I thought, hey, I've never heard from God this way. He said, God is sending a southern breeze to melt the hardest of hearts in your lives. And he predicted one day, you'll look back and your lives will never be the same. And how do you think that book got its name? <laughs> I left the healing conference experiencing God's promise. 
After you have suffered a while, I will restore, support, and strengthen you. And I will place you on a firm foundation. Isn't that awesome? I mean, I just love that scripture. And on the uh, plane ride back to Anaheim, I beg God repeatedly, God, let your southern breeze blow. Little did I know that day there would be a book with that word on it. <laughs> After Anaheim, Deborah and I knew that God would keep his promise. We trusted the Lord to melt the icebergs in, uh, within parts of our family. And we began to see the evidence of spiritual transformation within and around us. We began to experience that warmth of God's grace. Unfortunately, the healing for my marriage wasn't in that plan. And you know, I'm sorry to say that because God has a reason for putting a husband and wife together with no divorce. It isn't easy, and my precious children can say that. Things got worse, and we knew we had married for the wrong reasons. I married him out of desperation and loneliness. Remember, I'm the one that didn't have any furniture, so I had to have a place to live, unfortunately. And I had to face this fact when that marriage ended. It was time for me to let God heal me from the inside out. God's healing breeze began to blow through our families. After Anaheim, my relationship with Deborah flourished. She began to drop her guard and accepted me as a forgiven woman. We began talking on the phone nearly every day. She and Ron had built a beautiful ranch outside of Fort Worth. Rocky Top is what they call it. In most of my visits there, we were spent uh, hiking, laughing, and sharing our hearts. Deborah was half my size, and for some reason, she thought she could starve me and exercise me out of the range, and I'd start looking like her, but that never happened. But you know what? The one thing that was so crazy, do you know that we didn't even know that we were funny? I mean, I think I'm funny, but I didn't know she was, and all of a sudden, we started laughing, and we said, we know so little about each other. I mean, could I, can you imagine? I didn't even know my twin sister was funny. She had a great, dry sense of humor. And we did catch up on so much. And during one of my Texas visits, we really sat down and talked about Gretchen, our older sister. We had done to Gretchen what Deborah had done to me. We judged her, and we pushed her away. We both realized how wrong we had been and how important it was for us to be sisters. Now, as a forgiven woman, it was time to rebuild my life. Deborah's life was also being rebuilt. Love was being restored in my twin sister's marriage. She forgave Ron with a supernatural grace and promised to never discuss the affair again. Probably some of you that read that book wondered how on earth could a, wo a woman do that. But God can make anything happen. It was a joy to watch them fall in love. Deborah had been so cut off from all of us <laughs> that I watched them fall in love and giggle and kiss and all that. It was just something I hadn't seen much of. And as their, uh, their marriage flourished, all of a sudden she was free to let Deborah and me love her like we always wanted to. In all of our lives, the God's southern breeze was blowing just like that stranger in Anaheim had promised us. Compassion was also uh, growing in Deborah's heart. She soon encouraged Ron, a well-off art dealer, to serve meals with her to homeless shelter. In a dream she had, God showed her the face of a man that would change the city of Florida. One day, Denver, walks, uh, Denver walked into the uh, homeless mission where they were actually serving. He was a large and mean and imposing man living on the streets of Fort Worth. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Denver got Deborah's attention. When, she got, when he got Deborah's attention, then she got Ron's attention. <laughs> She said, Ron, I saw that man in my dream. I want you to be Deborah's friend. Now, remember what I told you. She was the boss of all of us. So Deborah prompted her unfaithful husband, as chronicled in the same kind of difference as me. 
they, that breeze began to blow between the two of them. These two unlikely men were hooked at their hearts and nobody could have changed it. Now for 10 years, our parents had been plagued by Alzheimer's and um, believe it or not, they died within two weeks of each other. It was really a relief because they had been so ill. But it wasn't long before my first granddaughter was born. She was born on July the 14th, that special birthday that Deborah and I celebrated. And I always wondered, was God preparing me in advance that I would be losing my partner and my person I celebrated my birthdays with? Five years later, another precious granddaughter was born. I had watched my daughter Denise become the mother I wanted to be. She and her husband, Greg, have thoroughly enjoyed their children. This is a gift that will continue to shape our family line for years to come. God's southern breeze melted the cycle of abuse in one generation to grow his loving kindness in generations to come. After Anaheim, my work wife was also brushed by God. One morning, now this is my story and I'm still amazed by it. <laughs> One morning at 4.30, I woke up and I felt like I had either had an amazing dream or I heard from God. Now, I would heard from God from that other man, but <laughs> I really heard from him myself. Quickly, I was just taking the God part of it, so quickly I got up and I got pen and paper and I wrote down and timed everything I saw. I'm going to tell you what. You need to remember what I'm saying because you know what these are? Spiritual markers. These are the markers that God is giving us to keep up with what he's doing for us. What I didn't know at the time, God was preparing me for my future career. My future career is also over there with Debbie Kirtland. <laughs> she has stood behind me and by me for way too long. <laughs> she never gave up on me. <laughs> Passion for my work was now a new feeling for me. I've never really felt passion. Within a few weeks, I quit my job that was giving me money to follow God's calling on my life. Now, let's don't forget, I'm the girl that quit learning in the seventh grade. I didn't even know how to write a business letter. I didn't know how to do anything. But I'll tell you what, when God's got his hand on you, you just go with him. And he's going to help you out, it looks like. You know, I've been doing it for 20-some odd years. With newfound confidence, I applied for my business license. And based on the details that God had given me in that vision, that's what I started my company on. Now, can you believe that? God actually planned that company for us. What we started doing 20 years ago... We're still doing, but just in a different way. The fear that had come, crippled me all my life was totally gone. No matter how many mistakes I made that first year, all of my invoices were paid on time. And Deborah, Deborah loved me laughed. She called and she said, I tell you what, God protects the foolish. I mean, she, she said, I cannot even believe you're doing this. During a Thanksgiving uh, visit with the ranch with uh, Deborah, Ron, and their kids, the decision was made for me to move to New York, to Manhattan. My business had opened up doors there, and I was traveling just about every week anyway, but I was always staying at a hotel. And my first response was complete fear. I don't care how many times I was over there. I was staying in a hotel. I was by myself. You know, I mean, I didn't have to make it on my own. Well, by the end of that visit, my fear was completely gone. And I shed it. And I started making plans to move to the Big Apple. Now, you know what's so amazing about that story? I sold my home, I sold my car, and I picked up and moved. <laughs> Can you believe that? I mean, how many people thought I was going to midlife crisis or just going crazy? Because, I mean, who would do something so crazy like that? But God had to carry me through the next phase of my life. I still laugh, and you I hope some of that first book is sad, but I hope you enjoy the second half of it because I stepped out on my own. So many crazy things were happening that instead of being embarrassed, I just learned to laugh at myself. I thought, I mean, you know, this is so crazy. And I journaled. I journaled and I journaled and I journaled. 
and I will never forget how God restored and renewed me. I became living proof of whenever it says in the Bible, God speaks clearly. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special faith on me. I am a miracle girl, some boys and guys and girls and everybody. After two years, after my move to New York, my life was shattered. I remember where I was the day that Deborah called me. She had just left for a yearly checkup, which we tried to schedule about the same time. She said there was a pain in her tummy, and the doctor was concerned, and they were sending her for more tests. She asked me to pray for her, but she said, now don't worry because I don't think it's anything. Well, after a CAT scan, a colonoscopy and surgery, the doctors found cancer in her colon and her face. It had spread to her liver. She had stage four cancer. And she had worked out the morning before she went for her uh, test. I tell everybody in this room, get a colonoscopy. I took the first departing flight from New York to uh, Texas. And I'll never forget walking into the room. Deborah looked at me, and all she could do was whisper the word, cancer. I had to stop and ask myself, did God decide to quit letting that southern breeze blow? I mean, this was my twin sister. We never ever talked about one day we might die and we might be gone. The next 19 months was a nightmare for me. The truth was exposed in the rawness of those days. What I discovered instead of drawing close to God, who spoke to me at Anaheim, I drew close to Deborah. I let her be my everything. The sicker she got, the more alone I felt. Ron was struggling also to survive. Denver and all those that loved Miss Debbie were praying a night and day around the clock. We just knew that the Holy Spirit would heal her. But as she deteriorated, we had to realize that uh, God was not going to answer our prayers. Let me read this right quick, and I think I'm over, but I'm going to try to hurry. This is from Ron's book, same kind of different as me. This is Denver. Mr. Ron, I've been out on the hill overlooking the city all night long praying. And I heard from the Lord. He said, Miss Debbie's body and crying out for paradise. But the saints here on earth still has a chain around her and won't let her go. So the Lord told me to come back and break that chain. Later I learned that 30 of Deborah's friends had gathered in our yard in the evening before, linking hands. They encircled our home to pray that God would heal her. Deborah continued, the Lord also told me to tell Miss Debbie that she could lay down her torch. And the Lord told me to pick it up. So Mr. Ron, out of obedience to God, I'm here to break that chain. After 19 months of praying for a miracle, it seems strange now that we'd be praying that God would take her. But as, uh, but as I began, new promises from Scripture came to my lips. Father, I prayed, help us as a family give Deborah over to you. Help us trust that you have ordained from the beginning the number of our days and that you won't take Deborah until she has completed her number of days. This is wrong. When we finished, Denver drilled me with a stare, and man, he was good at that, and surprised both of us with words that seemed to contradict his prayer. Still, Miss Debbie ain't going nowhere till her work on earth is done. Tears spilled from his eyes like I'd never seen him weep. His tears floated to the lines on his face like rivers of the And it hit me again how much he loved Deborah. I marveled at the intricate tapestry of God's providence. Deborah led by God to deliver mercy and compassion, had rescued this wreck of a man who, when she fell ill, in turn became her chief intercessor. For 19 months, he prayed to the night, and at dawn, he would deliver messages to us. He was like a heavenly paper boy. I was embarrassed, this is wrong, I was embarrassed that I once thought myself superior to him, stooping to sprinkle my wealth and wisdom into his loving life. After she got sick, 
Deborah and I managed to celebrate two birthdays. In fact, our last birthday, she gave me this beautiful cross, and I, I will always wear it on important occasions. <laughs> While she was struggling with the final ch- uh, stages of cancer, my ex-husband, my first love, and his wife were injured in a horrible motorcycle accident. Finally, the decision was made to take him off of life support. I asked his wife when it was my turn if she would come in with me. We held hands, and I thanked God for her children. And I thank God for the wonderful stepmother that she had become. And in those intimate moments, God's warm breeze was healing the relationships that had been strained for so long. My ex-husband died on the same day as Deborah. November the third will always be a sad day for us and our family. Many for many years my son had turned off any discussion about Jesus. Deborah planned her own memorial service. We all expected that. And it was to focus on salvation in heaven. When John Kevin and his wife, Missy, left the service, he said, said, Missy, I want what Aunt Debbie had. It wasn't long before he called me and said, Mom, I said that prayer. Even in the great mist of grief, God was sending his promise of the breeze. In a special ceremony, John Kevin was baptized in St. Simon's, Georgia, when he was 32 years old. After Deborah's funeral, I went back home to Anaheim and I felt hollow and lifeless. In a haze of grief, I went through the motions. One dreadful day, our nation joined me in a deep state of despair on September the 11th, ten months after Deborah's death, two suicidal planes hit the World Congress Trade Centers. Our city was filled with panic and, and um, pain, and our streets were lined with photographs of missing loved ones. Not only was I suffering, but I realized our country was suffering also. As I began to heal, I realized in those dark days that the Lord was laying a foundation for my future to the hurting and homeless. Things were changing in my life. God planted me in the soil of a loving Mary to John Angelo Pizziano. He still calls me his beloved. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> Is that the sweetest thing? During the time we were dating, he encouraged me to make things right with my older sister, Gretchen. After a year of loving her unconditionally, several weeks after attending the funeral, I got a call that she had died in her sleep alone. Thanks to my sweet husband's encouragement, I left the funeral with no regrets. I would have otherwise spent a lifetime of grieving for never making it right with her. This morning, and I, I if y'all want to leave, go ahead. <laughs> this morning, I'm going to read from my book. This will only be about five hours. <laughs> <laughs> Deborah's legacy continues to grow. After her death, more than a half a million dollars was given to Fort Worth Union Gospel Mission for the homeless in her name. With the publication of Ron Hall and Deborah Moore's New York Best Time Seller, same kind of different as me, along with speaking opportunities, over $70 million was raised. Can you believe that? One of Deborah's dear friends shared with Ron that she saw Deborah as a kind of wheat from John 12, 24. Very truly, I tell you, unless a carnival of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only seed, but if it dies, it produces for many, many seeds. Ron Hall is a seed. Denver Moore is a seed. The truth dogs on me. I am also a seed. Ron is married to a wonderful woman named Bad, and the Lord is growing for them a new wife. And Denver Moore just recently died. He carried Deborah's torch for nearly 12 years. Now I feel prepared by God to pick up the torch of my twin sister, Deborah. The Lord is growing within me, Deborah's passion for the hurting and homeless. I feel compelled to visit the men of the Trinity House. Along with my Bible study group, we pray for these men by name every day. I'm also invited to share our Southern Breeze in various venues throughout Atlanta. And each time I speak, I have committed to give $3.50 back to Trinity. I want you all to buy this. 
With this money and my prayers, I'm asking God to melt the icebergs littering the families of these forgiven men. I have a question to ask you. How will God's healing breeze look as it blows into your life? See, he didn't just have it for me. I don't know the details, but I do have this belief. I know God's warm breeze will keep blowing far and wide, melting hardened hearts and restoring once broken families. As I did years ago in that plane from Anaheim to Atlanta, I continue to pray day after day. God, let your son of Thank you.